So you might have been wondering, why am I talking so much about proxies in Spring together? And fear not, the curtain's going to be raised right now, and you're going to learn about Spring's transaction management or database management, which is one of the prime use cases for Spring anyway. So let's check it out. All right, so back in the project, you have to do a couple of very boring things first, and that means adding the needed libraries for Spring's transaction support. And from experience, when you go to the pomxml file, I know that you need two more libraries. One is called Spring TX for Spring's transaction management. And the other library is called Spring JDBC, which has some helper classes, methods, utility functions, which allow you to, you know, execute SQL calls against the database. Now the question is, what database are you going to use? I don't want you to have to install MySQL or Postgres or Oracle. Instead, you can use a embedded Java database called H2. You don't have to install it. You just have to put it as dependency into your project, like so. Any version will do, doesn't matter. But now you have the needed Spring libraries, context, TX, JDBC, and you also have a database. And that's really all you need. And then you can open up your application context configuration and now we need to do some cleanup from last episode because we had a fake data source in here. And now you don't want a fake data source. You actually want to open up a real connection to the database. That means you create a new Spring Bean, like so. And then thankfully there's a new, well not a new method, but there's a simple driver data source available in Spring. Actually, let's do it like so. You need to do two things. You need to tell the data source which database to connect to, and you do it with a driver. Make sure, because we're using an H2 database, you select the H2 driver here. And H2 has a very simple, let's say, URL scheme. So you can say JDBC H2 mem. Make sure you have a colon in here, and that means it's an entirely empty in memory database whenever someone connects to that database. And that's all we need for now. And then if I remember correctly, the user DAO, we also need to make it a component. That's what we didn't do at the end of the last episode. And auto wire our new data source in here, right? And if you want, you can check it out by running the application, just making sure that everything is still working as expected. And as you can see, sending out email and saving user to the database via data source, simple driver data source. So our setup obviously worked. Great. Now, how do we enable Spring's transaction management? And there's one very important well, line up front. Basically, whenever I say transactions now, I really just mean a database connection, an active database connection with an active database transaction. So the two words are really just interchangeable, connection or transaction for now. And thankfully in Spring, there's something called, an, there's an annotation called enable transaction management, which hopefully enables transaction management for us. And that annotation goes hand in hand with another annotation because now when you, let's first check out, check out again in the trading application what we do, we get the user service and we call register on that user service. So when you step inside the register method, you basically don't want the register method to have to open a database connection itself like we did in the previous episode. And also at the end, you don't want to close or commit or roll back your changes yourself. It would be somewhat, it would be nice if whenever your application steps inside the register method, automatically a database connection opens up. And whenever you step outside the register method again, the database connection is committed or closed automatically for you. And inside, you can simply call user day or save, which will simply generate some insert SQL statements. And the way you do that is with the transactional annotation. And transactional basically makes every public method inside a class transactional, which means it opens up and closes these database connections automatically. And just to cl clean things up and that there's not any magic involved, Let's delete that interface so you can see it simply is a normal class without any interfaces, without anything. But suddenly it only has one annotation in here, 
And if you don't want the close account method to be transactional as well, you can simply take the annotation and put it on one method, which means only the register method will be transactional, not the close account method. Let's see what that means. We have enabled transaction management here. We made our user service transactional. Let's rerun the application. Right, and suddenly you get an exception saying no such bean definition exception, no qualifying bean of type platform transaction manager available. And that's right, because to use transaction management, you also need something which is called a transaction manager. And I won't get into that much detail with the uh, transaction manager in this episode, because I'll save it for later episodes. But in any case, simply create a new bean and say, well, there's new data source transaction manager, which means transaction manager around that data source we specified down here. And uh, that should pretty much take care of opening up and closing database connections slash transactions. And now it obviously would be nice if we could see these transactions in the log. So maybe you wanna put in a system print and out statement here saying transaction open, right? And then there's a method in Spring. There's a utility class called transaction synchronization manager is actual transaction active, like so. You copy the line, put it down here. The whole line actually, like so. Let me clean things up a little bit here, right? And put a semicolon in here as well. In the trading application, here at the beginning, you don't expect a transaction to be open. So hopefully we see transaction open, no, or false. Also at the end, we expect transaction open to be false. But when you step inside user service register, it would be nice. And again, let's copy the whole line properly. You step inside the register method. Now, hopefully a transaction opens up. So let's just copy these lines in here. And it doesn't matter where you print out, where you check for the open transaction. You can do it at the beginning, at the end of the method, because for the whole method, the transaction should be active. Let's see if that works. Let's run the application again. And as you can see, the first line is transaction open false. And that's true because at the beginning, and that's right here in the trading application, right here, that's this line, you don't have a transaction open. Then you step inside the register method, which is transactional. Suddenly you have an open database connection. Isn't that crazy? Here, you also still have a, an open database connection. And then later on, the last line, when you step outside the register method, the database connection is committed, closed, and there's no database connection active anymore. That is pretty cool and that is pretty wicked because now, as you can see, you have a user service, no interface, no nothing. It's a simple component with one annotation. It doesn't have to worry about opening up and closing database connections. It can simply send select statements, insert statements, update statements to a database and the rest will be handled by the proxy. That's right. And in case you're wondering what kind of proxy is this, what kind of class or object is the user service? What you can do is put in a breakpoint here, debug the application, and see what the user service is. And when you look at the user service in the debug window, you can see it says user service enhancer by spring CG lib and a ton of CGLib callbacks. It doesn't look like the user service from last episode with our two fields, which is the mail service and user DAO. It says something about CGLib. And as an exercise, you can already read up about CGLib on your own. Just find out what it is and how it compares to plain Java proxies. But for this episode, it's enough to know that CGLib exists and the rest will follow soon. Congratulations, you now know how Spring's transaction management works. But how does it really work under the hood? Spring uses a library called CGLib, and it's a very good idea to get used to CGLib, especially when you're debugging Spring projects. So let's have a look at that library in the next episode.